You're listening to Tripod, the tricycle creative podcast, produced for anyone interested in being a better digital and content marketer. Host Ross Erosion is a marketing coach, content creator, and entrepreneur who brings you helpful tips, social media updates, inspiring interviews, and his own unique perspective on how to tell your story and grow your business. So sit back, relax, and let's get pedaling. 2020 Rewind rolls on, and before we jump into this episode, I have to ask, have you subscribed to Tripod? I mean, I love that you're listening to this episode, but I would love it even more if you continue to get episodes that I'm putting together to help creative business owners safely navigate digital marketing and business growth. Subscribing is super easy, and you can do it pretty much wherever you get your podcasts. So thank you so much for doing that. On this episode, my Rewind and Tripod Live co-host Hillary Houghton joins me to discuss how I might be angry when caffeinated, how getting to know yourself will better serve your business, and how meetings can drain your energy like a succubus. And if you enjoy this episode, I'd also recommend you check out the Tricycle Creative YouTube channel where Hillary and I have hosted many videos where we've talked about digital marketing news, tools, tips. I'll go ahead and put the link in the episode description and in the show notes at tripodpodcast.com. She is no stranger to Tripod, Tricycle Creative. Hillary, welcome. What's up, Ross? Uh, nothing. We were just talking about, it's like a, not even really the afternoon we're recording this, but how tired we both were. One o'clock is a hard time. I just vegged out, had a little bit of lunch. Usually at the noon, let me give you a little peek inside my world. I do, I kind of like a lazy intermittent faster. So I won't eat my first meal until 1130 or noon. Mm -hmm. So I start to get cranky around that time, but I have eaten. You're safe there. And then I usually watch my sports talk programs for like an hour in the middle of the day. And then I'm back at work. So it's like the little lunch break that I give myself. That's so, a good break. yeah, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. We were talking about our energy drinks of uh, uh, our preferential energy drinks. And you, because <laughs> you thought I was drinking a monster drink. And I said to her, this, I wondered if she thought me to be a person that drinks monster energy drinks. I'm like, Ross, you bold man. I'm in with a white monster energy in the middle of the day. It's only one o'clock on a Thursday. I don't think it's safe for someone my age to drink monster energy drinks. Oh Is it safe? I mean, honestly. You're, you're running a mile. <laughs> I would be dead. I would die. I've talked about one time I had a jolt. Do you ever have or remember jolt cola? I don't. So it was like it marketed itself as like eight times the caffeine of a cup of coffee. And it came in like, I think it was very appropriate. The size of the, the glass bottle it came in was like the size of a grenade, which again, I feel like very appropriate. But I remember as a kid, I drank it once. My dad never let me, but somehow we stopped at the gas station. I got some and I drank it once. And it was like I was a drunk person. Like I smashed the bottle. And I was just like rowdy as heck. So again, maybe someone my age shouldn't have a monster energy drink. Maybe, maybe you're saying that, you know, in your, in your past life, you've shown to be an angry caffeinated man. <laughs> I hooked out on caffeine. So it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Well, I can't guarantee I'm not going to hulk out on this conversation, but I probably won't. When we're talking about 2020, I, I don't, it may be hard not to hulk out in, in just frustration but I think there's a lot of good that can also come from 2020, right? So trying to be an eternal optimist. Um, I want to talk about, I guess let's first take a, a step back. Do a quick introduction, who you are, what you do, for any of those ding-dongs out there that this is their first episode they're tuning in and meeting lovely Hillary. Yeah, for anyone who's coming back, hey, what's up? Hello, good to hear from you. From anyone new, I'm Hillary Houghton. I'm the founder of Social HQ, which is a social media consultancy based in Austin, Texas. We work with brands across the country to help them really hone in and specialize on connecting with their community online and turning their loyal followers into their ambassadors and into their buyers. So that's really the overview of what I do. But 
aside from that, I'm a daughter, I'm a fiance, I'm a friend. Co-host. I'm a co-host. I've got a lot of other hats that I'm wearing. So So many hats. She's wearing them all right now. It looks just silly. She's just a silly. One fun bun. (laughs) One fun bun and six hats. So silly. Well, when did you, maybe spoiler alert here, but when did you start your company? So I started in 2020. I came from Phoenix, which was a really interesting market. So backing it up even further in the early 2010s, when I was graduating college and I was looking for which move I wanted to make, I thought I wanted to go to New York. I thought I wanted to work in advertising there. And I had an opportunity to go to Phoenix. And Phoenix is not known for being an advertising hub. It's not known for being a creative market. But I saw a lot of opportunity as far as it's such a gateway for a lot of transplants. So you have a lot of talent from California. You have a lot of talent from Chicago who all tend to come to the sunny skies of Phoenix. So I saw an opportunity there. I pivoted. I went there and I ended up at an agency called OH Partners for five years and grew a social media department there alongside some incredible people. And uh, I just, I loved it. I loved building something. And the fact that I got into the agency at a really unique time because it wasn't large. It was 20, 30 people. They didn't have a social media team. So I really was given a lot of flexibility to create from scratch. And then when I, uh, my fiance and I picked up and moved to Austin, he got a new role out here. And I was thinking about, okay, what's my next move? Am I going to go in house? There's a ton of agencies here in Austin that are incredible. You know, what do I want to do? And I felt that same feeling from when I first started in Arizona, which was, I could start something from scratch again. I could, I've done it before. I can do it again. And this market in Austin is just so rich with amazing brands. I don't want to tie myself just to one. I want to be able to work with multiple and I want to be able to still work with companies across the nation. And I think not only brands, but entrepreneurs, right? So I want to ask you now, if you've just having started the business this year, what's one good thing that happened to you this year? And maybe it was starting your business. I don't know. Yeah. Honestly, launching Social HQ was one of the greatest things that happened to me this year. It was a perfect intersection between right before the pandemic hit. So I was already two feet in the water. Uh, No, no backing out now. (laughs) Sorry. No life preserver. You're in it now. No backing out now. Um, But that was really just, I have never felt so empowered and excited about what I do every day. I love the clients that I work with. I love being able to come in and solve a problem from the outside and get in. I've said this before. Isn't that, I think that's a very interesting and connecting thing for Mm -hmm. people who like and do marketing. I don't know if it's so much that they love marketing. Many of us do, but I think at their very core, they are curious one problem solvers too. I think that's what marketing, that's what modern, I guess maybe not even modern marketing. That's what marketing I feel like is all about. I would agree. And I think that sometimes there's, especially if you're in house or if you've been working on the same client for a long time, having the trigger in you to pivot, to think differently, to put your consumer front of mind. What are they thinking? How are their behaviors changing? And you know, being so adaptable and agile, that's something that's really unique about being a consultant versus being an in-house team member. Yeah. And I think it comes with obviously its own amount of freedoms. You know, we were just, again, when we were starting up, we were talking about how, you know, this is a day where I had uh, three, four meetings And weirdly enough, like I feel really drained. And I was thinking back to when I was in the corporate world, there'd be days where I had twice as many meetings. Like, I mean, six, eight, an entire day. Right. Mm -hmm. And I said to Hillary, I must've been really pissy and really tired in some of those meetings. And because I just can't imagine like that whole day. And when you're an entrepreneur, uh, you, you, you know, in a business owner, you have a little more control over that. I tend to only schedule a max of three meetings a day, you mm-hmm. know, just to try to keep my brain going and you can, you, you get, it's that idea of control, right? Yeah. You're never going to have total control, 
but you have more control when you are doing your own thing. Yeah. And I think that to the same vein, that benefit falls on the clients too. Yeah. They don't yeah. have to schedule every meeting. They don't have to include you in the meetings. There's a lot of, I don't want to say politicizing meetings of making sure everyone's involved and everyone has visibility yeah. and everybody's there. And if who, why didn't you invite Joe? I mean, there's none of that when you're a consultant because at the end of the day, our job is to make it easier for our clients to not have to pick up the weight of us. I mean, we're here to serve you. We're here to make your life easier. We're here to take off time off your plate. So I, it doesn't work for everyone, but for me, I found it really has been working well this year. Want to hear a funny story about young wide-eyed Ross? I do. I love. Okay, I knew. I knew you Ross. would. So this was when I moved. I was about three years into. I mean, literally my first job, right? And I moved from being an on-air host in the radio, and then moved into HR, into collegiate recruiting, and starting an internship program. And I remember distinctly, um, you know, they hired me as like the wild card hire right? I didn't have any HR experience, anything like that, but there were HR meetings that would take place and I wouldn't be included. Right. Cause I, what did I know? Like I'm, I'm not an expert on benefits. I didn't need to be in the meeting. And I remember talking to my boss and being like, or thinking, man, I really wish I could be in more meetings. This is young, relatively fresh out of college, couple years out of college, Ross, man, I wish I could be in more meetings. What, 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 boy, howdy, did I not know what Pandora's box that wish would open up as you my career evolved. You, where more you could, <laughs> and then it got a couple of years later, I'm like, I, I got to get out of these. How do I get out of meetings? How, how do I get out of these things? These are yeah. bananas. And so I think it's to your point, it's like this, uh, it's almost like, uh, 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 just a weird abusive relationship some corporate entities have with like meetings and meeting culture uh -huh. that it's just like to the point of obsessive. And I will say meetings have declined number new, the quantity since I started and ran my, it's been running tricycle creative, yeah. but the quality has gone up yeah. because you know, you can be more selective. You can, you know, it's about energy. I talk about this a lot. You know, it's like, all right, well, I'm tired today from two meetings because I gave like my full energy in those meetings, my full attention. Yeah. You know, it gets to a point where you keep stacking those things up. You're just not getting the best of you. Yeah. You're not going to be able to contribute as much. And there's too many moving pieces that are happening. And especially I, I feel like the higher in rank that you get and the more responsibility that you have, the more meetings that you're in because you have to be, visible to making those decisions. But I will say that in my last year, when I was working at the agency, I got a lot more selective about the meetings that I attended. I said no more. Yeah. Um, and it's that, empowering. It is empowering, but it was also out of respect for the team that I had. You know, if I had a account manager who could be on the call and I can trust them to relate back to me anything that I need, um, and then vice versa, if they're not yeah. able to attend a meeting, I'm in there and I'm plugging and playing with them. So part of that comes to relationship building in the organization. Part of it comes down to trust. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it, I transferred a lot of that mentality over into the agency that I run now, Social HQ, because I don't set meetings for an hour and a half ever. I, I'll set a 45 minute meeting mm -hmm. um, unless I'm onboarding a new client. We're not going to meet for longer than an hour. Most of my meetings are 30 minutes, maybe even 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and if we don't need to stick around, we don't need to chat. We don't need to chat. Um, I know. That's the other thing about the corporate meetings too. Like agenda list meetings oh, that okay. just where you're like, what is going? Can we move it along here? Can Nothing I love more than talking in circles. Ah, uh, <laughs> it's like listen. I love that we're all here and talking about our weekend, but the reality is, I got a, I got an inbox that's exploding, and the tasks, and the team, and a whatever. You know, let's let's move on. So, I want to know as we come to a close of 2020, what, uh, what's your biggest challenge? 
as we, you know, as we go into 2021, what are you seeing as kind of your, 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 your biggest challenge, or I guess the challenge maybe you're still wrestling with from this year? I mean, the obvious answer is that COVID has been crazy and chaotic. So I won't go with that answer. (laughs) Too easy. Too easy. But (laughs) in the same vein, and what was also one of the greatest things to happen this year was launching a business. That has been equally the most exciting and the most challenging (laughs) part of this year. And, you know, I'll really say that in March and April, when we didn't know what COVID was going to be. We were at the beginning of it. I remember you and I were talking because you and I had just met right before. Yeah, was that when I was just, when you were talking about how it hit? I mean, that was when we first, I was thinking that was, was right about, around the time when we first met. It was because we met at a restaurant, walked right in, no masks, no problem. Oh, yeah, we weren't in. A, you're right. That's the time. That's the indicator. You're yeah. right. I remember meeting you, no masks. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that honestly, for me, it was right at the time because it takes a while to get leads. It takes a while to connect with your folks who are going to come and work with you. And that was around the time that I was starting to pick up traction in the business. And that immediate fear of, oh, snap, what did I just get myself into? Um, And aside from that, I am at my core a very risk averse person. I play it safe. Like in soccer, when everyone's running towards the ball, I'm like in the back. <laughs> I don't want that ball in my face. So <laughs> that's who I am. And I'm not picking you for our team soccer I team. Don't pick me. No, 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 no. I would be awful. I'm a great cheerleader, but okay. no. no anything, anything that comes with pain. And I've been this way for years. Um, and so for me to go out on a limb this year and trust in myself and take that leap of faith, that was actually huge for me. What does a risk averse person do to oh. start to, to be able to start a business? Oh man. I mean, a lot. I mean, yeah. a lot, of, a lot of it was saving savings to the point where um, you know, I felt very comfortable if I had to float myself for a couple months um, putting together a really strong business plan and putting together a lot of factors in place and practices that I would do every day to ensure that I was getting enough exposure, that I was putting myself out there. Uh, and it wasn't perfect. And it was a lot of it having to do with the community that I had of people who said, you can absolutely do this. Uh, and then getting over that fear of saying, well, it's not perfect. I, it's not a sure thing. I don't know. Um, but then saying, you know what? I don't have kids. I'm not in a position where I am at risk of anything. I don't have any health problems. I'm very lucky for that. Why not just go for it? Why not just fail if it's going to fail? But at least I tried. So, and I'm so grateful that at the beginning of 2020, I decided to do that. However, throughout (laughs) this year and the changes, I mean, the amount of times that I just crawled up into my little blanket and watched some shits creak and said, Take me away. <laughs> Take me away, Mora. <laughs> oh, Danny boy. Oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. So it's been incredibly challenging to get through that and to push through that innate fear that I always have. But I feel like I have made tremendous progress. You know, you're not the only person in this little mini series I'm doing, you know, who started their business this year, mm-hmm. you know? And I mean, I even talked with, um, uh, one of my, I, th- I think it's safe to call him a friend now. His name's Matt Murphy. And he left a career of 20 plus years, you know, to go out and start his business this year. You know, I think it's, and it's interesting. I don't know if it's intentional, right? But to your point, the COVID thing, I mean, kind of really was like a, it's like a hot, cold tr- trust fall. I don't know, exercise mm-hmm. where it's like, all right, are you, are you in this? Like, are you in it? Are you going to walk across those coals? Yeah. Are you going to do this or not? Like it was, it was the most intense game of like chicken for the new business owners that I, I've ever ex- seen experienced at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it was, it really amped up. Yeah. 
every concern, challenge, everything for new business owners, creators. And it was, it's just something to, I almost kind of feel like it was also an accelerator in some ways, you know, where it's like, all right, well, the pressure's on. Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to stay at it. I'm going to keep at it. And it's, it's just been something very interesting as I talk to many other creatives and creative business owners. Yeah. And I, I will say that circumstance and where you're at has a lot to do with it too. hundred percent. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I am extremely lucky that <clears throat> I have a fiance Great. who has a very stable career is wonderfully supportive. And I know that not everybody has that. And true. when I was single, a couple of years ago, and I had thought, you know, could I go out on my own? That was a huge factor for me. I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm past the point where I have parents that I can fall back on. I'm past the point where I've got, mm-hmm. uh, you know, anything else around that I can fall back on. And so for people who are out there who don't have an extra layer of security or something that is helping them or supporting them along the way, that's a very different place to be when you're in the midst of a pandemic and you're saying, should I go forward with this risk or not? And it's still risky for me. It was still a huge risk. Um, But I think that that's just such an important distinction to make too, especially if someone did have to pull out of their own business and go back into corporate for security reasons. Yeah. I, you're a hundred percent right. Circumstances are a huge factor in, I think success of, of business. I think for anyone out there that, may not be as fortunate mm-hmm. I'll say as us, but we just may, may not have the, the, some of these, these, these support networks. I think there's two things and you, you actually mentioned them both. Um, first is don't worry about perfection. I think that's a big thing, right? And it's hard for me. I'm an obsessive. I like, I like things to be perfect, but I have to get myself out of that and be like, you know, I th- don't let perfection get in the way of production. Mm -hmm. You know, some people obsess over it so much that nothing happens. And I think when you're first starting off, don't worry about perfection. Just worry about getting it done. And the second thing you said, you talked about kind of, um, you'd mentioned almost like take almost, I say, take calculated risks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever you are doing, um, kind of do it strategically. If that makes sense, have a plan. I think that's important. I think it gives you a sense of security at some amount of security blanket, even if it's one thing a month you're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Document it, have a plan of how you're going to do it, have a plan of how you're going to measure it. And for anyone out there that is at this point of starting something, um, I would definitely recommend, I mean, listen, there's any number of books for sure. There's a million books we could probably rattle off, but one that's really good. That's not necessarily a business book, but is very good for creative business owners. It's called The Dip by Seth Godin. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a little subtitle, I believe is I'm looking at on my, on my bookshelf over here. It's something to the effect of knowing when to stick and when to quit. And it's a very interesting book that kind of walks through, you know, uh, this idea of strategic quitting and that quitting is not always bad Mm -hmm. if it's based in kind of whether it's data or in gut, Mm -hmm. like how much are you willing to go through the pain? to get to the result. Yeah. And if you are not okay, but identify it and just cut bait as they say. Right? If I'm not willing yeah. to go through the pain, and I know that's a hard thing to do, and I'm and I'm very much summarizing this book maybe, but like knowing that listen, I'm not willing to go through the work or the pain for that. That may mean your business that you're not cut out to necessarily be a business whatever, but it's at least a good thing, it's a good habit to start, right? Before you Go through the pain, st- stress, failure, and then give up. That's yeah. the worst thing. That's the worst way to do it. You it's know, such a, it's such a hard line to walk. It is. I'm, it's I'm incredibly it difficult. As that you know, fear monger. Yeah, <laughs> totally. It is a hard line to walk. And I'm not saying he gives you the perfect equation, but I am saying it's a book that that gets you thinking about that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, I love that. I listened um, to a um, podcast the other day about emotional agility. Are you familiar ooh, with the term? No. Oh my gosh. So I, I, I listen occasionally to Ed Milet. I don't know if you are familiar mm-hmm. with him. 
he has a great podcast. He's definitely in kind of the, um, I mean, I'm not a huge Tony Robbins fan, but you know, he's kind of in that same sphere of, uh, you know, empowering, especially with business owners and hustler mindset. And so I was listening to him and he was talking with a woman named Susan David, who I think she's a psychologist who focuses on emotional agility. And so she applies that same mentality of essentially what you are is you're being more uh, in tune with how your thoughts and your limiting beliefs and like what you, what stories you make up about yourself of what you can and can't do and what you should and shouldn't do and all that, you know, jabs. Um, so it's really interesting. She has a quiz on her website as well that you can take to kind of test, you know, where you might get hung up. Uh, apparently I need to work on being kinder to myself. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Very, very high standard. You're not doing the self care when you're talking. I'm good at self care. Um, yeah. but I cut everyone around me so much slack and then I do <laughs> not apply it to myself. It's spot on. <laughs> I'm like, you, you know, there was a meme and it was like, you know, meme, you don't have to be productive in 2020. And then it's like my brain, it's like, not you though. <laughs> not you though. <laughs> I'm like, that's me. You're not a, it's a, not, it's a, was it say as I, was it do, do as, as I say, not as I do? Yeah. Some sort of, yeah. My mom said that to me all the time growing up. Yep. So I want to ask you then on that note, that brings me nicely to my third question for you. What do you plan or would you like, ideally plan, but what would you like to change or improve about your life or even your business in 2021? Uh, Oh, that's a great question. I'm one of those crazy people who doesn't wait till the first. I actually usually start my 2021 plan in November (laughs) because I like to get ahead, you know? (laughs) overachiever. Sure. I get you. So I have, we've got some awesome stuff coming in the works. I have really, uh, you know, especially back to your idea from Seth Godin is, uh, being more disciplined in what I'm working on and what social HQ is going to be and what we're going to do. So, you know, in business, it's going to be really exciting stuff coming out for companies and for social media managers. I'm very excited about it. I'll leave that nugget here. Ooh, um, so we'll see that come out in Q1 and Q2. So those are going to be awesome to launch. And then, you know, in personal, I'll have a new last name. So oh, that's, yeah. I'm professional. You're going to have to get a new license. You're going to have to get a new license. <laughs> so know, that's a big, awesome. yeah. So wow. but yeah, it's a, that's it's a biggie. really exciting. You're not going to hyphenate? That's a very long hyphenated last name. I'm just going to have to. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I ever told you. We were uh, um, we were considering when I got married to my wife, um, creating a new last name from both of our last names. That would be so 2020 of you. Right? It felt, though, here's why we didn't. So her last name is Strong. My last name begins with Hero. So we were going to do a hero strong thing, but it felt so on the nose that it just felt like too kitschy. It does feel kitschy, right? I love that you guys have hero and strong in your names. So yeah, cool. but it felt a little too kitschy. And I felt like my friends would never not maybe make fun of me. And I, I give them enough reason to do that. That I don't feel like a permanent a permanent thing like my last name should I should give them that ammunition. I if mean, you that'd will. be pretty cool. I've met people who've changed their last names before. Yeah, I I I you know the hyphenation can get tricky, particularly sometimes in email settings or in professional settings. It's so true. You know, I'm gonna go from a very thing. very difficult last name to get right to a very easy one. So well, that's a that's an upgrade right. name upgrade. I you know? know, so all right, I get you. Well, I look forward to that name. When we have you on, it'll be like, it'll be a new Dead guest. Dinner. It'll be, yeah, it'll be like new, new. When is your, oh, may I ask? May, now it's just like personal April. questions. April. April. 
Okay. Send your gifts. We'll put we'll put the address in the show notes. Just kidding. we're not gonna do that. Well, we could if you want it. We'll put your registry in there. If you give me a registry, I'll put it in there. Okay. Not. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question. Maybe my favorite of them. Recommendations. Now I, I want to premise or, or or put something in here first. We are also about to do a show in November of 2020. Hillary and I are doing a show, marketing tools that we're thankful for. And it's going to be one hell of a show. It's on the Tricycle Creative YouTube channel. Um, you can check it out there. It's going to be an amazing, amazing show. We're going to go through all these different marketing tools in different categories, the ones we're thankful for and the ones we use and the ones we love. But maybe a cut down version of that or maybe something different because recommendations can be music. It can be a, a, a marketing thing. It can be a business thing. It can be a book. I'm just going to toss it all at you and you tell me what recommendations you have for our listeners. Such an open-ended question. It is. So I will throw out a couple. Uh, my first recommendation would be, and this is more in the tech space, but I love my Apple watch. Oh my. Oh my. I love oh my. my Apple watch. I got it a year and a half ago and it yells at me. To stand up and go walk around. And yet you still recommend it. And I love it. I love it. I need, I'm one of those people who, when I'm in the zone, I will not get up. Ooh, for yeah. Hours. yeah, I hear you. And I actually drain myself more when I'm focused in like that for so long. And so then I end up just sitting there and spinning my wheels. And then we get back to, you know, I need to cut myself some slack and take a break. It's very yep. hard for me to say, Hillary, you need a break. Take but my break. Apple phone watch is like, girl, get up. Okay, <laughs> let's go. So I would definitely say that the Apple watch has honestly been wonderful for me. So if you struggle with, um, you know, getting up or really just want to get more in tune with, your activity level. Mm -hmm. How many steps did I actually take today? It's very nice. Mm -hmm. That would be one. Books, uh, the subtle art of not giving a. This is, you could, we can label it as explicit. It's okay. Beep. Whoa, it's been edited. The subtle art of not giving a. F this is a family friendly podcast. Yeah, whoa, saucy. Mark Manson. I'm a huge fan. I think I, I have that book on my I think I have that book on my wish list for Christmas, I think. It's a good one. I will say it starts off really strong and it, up until like the last chapter. Once I got to the last chapter, I was like, I feel like his editor was like, you need to wrap this up in a like fluffy <laughs> It just all of a sudden just ends. All of it, well, it gets like, like Star Wars. Fluffy. Got it. I don't know. I, I sometimes question book editors. So Palpatine, Emperor Palpatine makes a return at the, you don't know what that means. Yeah. I mean, I, he has a really deep story and a really, you know, important story to him that he kind of ties it back to. But for something that was pretty lighthearted, tough world yeah. to end on that note, I was a little surprised. But it's really good. I think that it. I actually, you know what? This is where, how dumb dumb I am. I might be reading this book right now. I'm serious. I, so, no reading. It's Currently reading it. Like the color red. Well, I know, but here's the thing. I have it on my Kindle. And I have so many oh, books on my Kindle that you. I bounce around. I try yeah. to finish one for, but I've been in a bad habit recently. I've been bouncing around. And I actually think I'm reading this book right now. I don't have you the Kindle near me. You sure are. I really do think I am. Yeah, he's going to like another book first. related to that. In hot dog. If, if, if you're into yeah. it. The the War of Art. Have you ever read that? I haven't. I've heard of it. Very similar, I believe. Um, it's a quick read, super quick read. But it talks, the War of Art is all about essentially the stalling mechanism in your brain that prevents you from creating. Really quick read, great read, recommend it. I think it's in the same vein as the subtle art of not giving a fudge. Interesting. So um, you can double down because I think they both are. It's a, was that a quick read? The subtle art? It's pretty. Yeah. I got right? through pretty quickly. It's pretty yeah. easy to read. Okay. Another thing is that I'm a, a little bit more in the category. I was a psych minor back in the day. I was a psych major. 
but then like how you I, say that like there's some sort of you know major i was a communications <laughs> major so i feel like you know it's like what am i gonna do about it i mean but come on i love i love psychology so that's kind of my my tie mm, I, I love okay. the human mind i love how understanding how people think i love how and why they have behaviors um and why they act so something that's always been really interesting to me uh and that was a part of the practice that I did when I was a manager was Myers Briggs test. Mm -hmm. Taken that? I took it a long time ago. I do not remember my score except I think I begin with an E. Of course. Can you do them for free? Yeah. What is that supposed to mean? I don't know what. That's an extrovert, it... Ross. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> yes. The yeah, I think I can safely say I'm an extrovert. Though. I think it's pretty safe to say I I'm an extrovert. Like Maybe. Yes, Ross, you are. E N E E N. Am I E N? I think it's an E N. There's like a game of Wheel of Fortune. I think I was E N. Intuitive. Okay. And then I forget the rest. Feeling or thinking and then perceptive or intuitive. I mean, I'm not, I I don't want to guess because the test is very revealing. You may think you're one thing and you're not, right? That's kind of maybe part of the, the whole thing. So 16personalities.com, 16personalities.com. I'm a a huge proponent of understanding how you operate, but I'm also a huge proponent of understanding how other people operate, especially if you're in a team setting. Um, You know, that is one of them. DISC assessments, D-I-S-C, that's used a lot in sales uh, categories, but it just, it helps you to understand the way in which people operate and how they will take feedback, how they'll give feedback. And as a coach or a mentor or a mentee, it just helps unlock a lot more understanding with each other, which I think is really important. I think that the connection with one another um, and understanding the values of each other and just how we interact and what's important to us, I think that's just super important. So that would be a little I love that. recommendation, but I love, I love that. Well, also I think in the spirit of getting to know yourself a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like I know these things can be very illuminating, you know, it's like, Oh, like that's how <clears throat> I know I behave this way, but this kind of gives somewhat of an insight as to maybe why, or, yeah. or uh, you know, or how I, who I match up with, mm-hmm. you know, again, that's another benefit of owning your own business, you know, is that you should, as a former recruiter, you should absolutely be very thorough in your search. You should include diversity in that. That is a huge, huge, critically important component of recruiting and staffing. But I think, you know, personality can very much be a factor also. I talked about this with a co-founder, Roman uh, Gonzalez of Gardenio, when he took on a co-founder. He took on the co-founder. Mm-hmm. Finding someone with complementary. Yep. Right. I think everyone thinks that, oh, I want to hire someone just like me. I would not hire someone just like me. I am a nightmare. I personally would never, I would not get along with me. Yeah. I need someone very different than me. It's right? nice. It's it's great to have somebody who has a completely different way of thinking than you do. Um, you know, I am a, I'm a feeler. I feel, I think critically, but not nearly as much as I feel. <laughs> critically. So for me, it's important to have others around me who do have more of that, you know, thinking pattern um, and are able to cut through some of the feelies, feelies that I know. I'm like, well, did they mean to say that? Because it came (laughs) off like this. And he's like, no, they just said this. I'm like, (laughs) thank you. Let me read between the lines. Well, sometimes just read the lines. You don't need to, you know, sometimes, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I love that. 16 personalities. Dot one of them com. And then Dot another com. one that is a little bit more business focused. And this one is super cool. It's called Crystal Nose. Crystal Nose. Okay. And so All right. Crystal Nose also has a Myers-Briggs test within it, but they also open up into other tests. So you can do your disc assessment. You can do, you know, a bunch of other ones. There's ones with colors. I mean, all these different management tools. So especially as a small business owner, it's interesting. And another factor with that, though, is that it lines up with your role. So what you can do is what your job is and your day-to-day operations and what you do. And it's going to say what kind of a match you are with that role. 
based on wow. your personality. It's going to tell you what. What if I find out I'm not supposed to be a, a founder and CEO? Oh no! Courage. I have to quit. <laughs> like Seth says, have <laughs> courage. Full circle, baby. But it's a harsh way for me to find out. I mean, online I had taken it when I was at the agency and I was like a 60%. And that was a time that was really challenging at the agency. And I knew I was getting drained in a lot of different ways. Um, and then when I became a consultant, I took it again. I got 99%. I was going to say maybe dumb question, but it seems like that can change over yeah, time, right? Absolutely. That's not a dumb question. Like I know looking back again, we're talking about like even my former career and whatever going back. Like I, th I think I was a very, like a very different person. Absolutely. And I mean, think about it. If you are in meetings all the time, all of a sudden, and that's drinking, you. or if you are in a time of transition or acquisition or changing agencies, I mean, all of those factors can yeah. put new stresses on you that transform not only how you are reacting in that moment, but how you will carry that and that type of reaction and that type of memory into the future. So it's just, it's interesting. Right. Well, I would, I would recommend everyone go check those out, do a self-assessment. Sounds really neat. Are there any other recommendations that you have for the people, for the listener? I could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, save them. Don't don't use them all up. Again, if you're interested in more of our very specific marketing and business recommendations, hop on over to the Tricycle Creative YouTube channel. Uh, search for the uh, marketing tools we recommend video. Uh, it'll be there. It's going to be pretty comprehensive. I'm looking forward to that show. We've been uh, planning it for a while. We're going back and forth as we speak on what we're going to include. And uh, it's going to be chock full of goodness. And speaking of chock full of goodness, where can people go to find and connect with you, Hillary? You can find Social HQ at yoursocialhq.com and on all social media channels at yoursocialhq is our handle. So find us on Instagram and LinkedIn if you want to check us out and see what's going on. What about LinkedIn is your currently your favorite platform? Are you, are, will you allow people to connect with you on LinkedIn? I always allow people to connect with you. <laughs> Come on over. I do have people sit in purgatory for a while if they're clearly trying to sell me something. But Don't try to sell her something, you jerk. Just, just connect to, with her and talk with her. Just try to be a part of my network. Come now on, let's just bro. Let's fill this place up. I'm, how many? I, listen, it's enough already. I don't need an app to be built. I get it. It's okay. Anywho. All right. Well. Thank you, Hillary, as always, for being a guest on Tripod. Um, for everyone out there, check out our recommendations. Check out Hillary's business. And until next time, as always, I encourage you to keep pedaling. Thanks for listening to Tripod. Be sure to subscribe and rate the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Show notes can be found at tripodpodcast.com. Connect with Tricycle Creative on social media at Hello Tricycle and learn more about how we can help you with your marketing at tricycle-creative.com.